great to see you today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and uh, let's wel- welcome you folks online. We're thrilled that you've joined us. I got a picture this morning from um, Ellen Cordner, who's our online host today, and uh, sitting out in the sunshine in Arizona with a wireless laptop. It was really disgusting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I know you guys are having an amazing time down there. By the way, one of the things we want to make available to the GFAM is um, some of you for time, from time to time want special prayer. And uh, if today you want prayer, uh, some of our School of Ministry students would love to pray with you. And if you'll just simply uh, text your name and your number uh, to 307-370-7203, someone will call you this afternoon and uh, we'll pray with you. And uh, so God bless you. We believe that God hears and answers prayer in Buffalo, Wyoming, and wherever you are today. And uh, welcome to folks in Sheridan, Gillette, Buffalo, and the surrounding areas. Sometimes we call out people from afar, but um, welcome to you who are near as well. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. A powerful, a powerful word for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now we remember last week the word gospel is the word euangelion, which means good news. Anybody here need some good news? And so the gospel is full of good news. We've all heard enough bad news. So he sent me not to baptize, but to, or to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Say that with me. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. One of the things that exist is many cults do not have a cross. They don't believe in the power of cross because it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved... It is the power of God. Say it with me. To those who are being saved, it is the power of God. One more time. To those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Good news is especially good news when it's attached to the power of the cross. And I want to talk to you today about the power of the cross. Actually, the songs we sang preached probably better than I can. But, um, man... There's power in the cross. This cross behind me is not a religious symbol. Please don't make it that. Um, The cross behind me is the power of God for the salvation of souls. All of us should gaze at the cross that Jesus shared in our lives. And um, he, you were there with him. I was there with him when he died on the cross. Let me give you about six things this morning. The first one is it's at the cross where the very thing that's work for, let me say it again, on the cross, Jesus became the very thing that was working. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. All of us, somebody say all of us, us. like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's plan to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of, of us all. Every sin that you've ever committed was nailed to the cross. Every sin that I've ever committed, nailed to the cross. And the Lord laid them on Jesus. Um, no wonder the Father turned away from him in that moment. And Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time he ever called the Father God. And Jesus then said, It is finished. And so everything that's assigned to destroy you, Jesus won the victory over that in the cross. The sin that we have in our lives, it's meant to destroy us. We call it sometimes mistakes. We call it um, uh, difficulties. We call it um, shortcomings. We call it, um, uh, it's in our DNA. But I want to declare to you, Jesus, whatever you call it, forgives sin and does it thoroughly and he gives you the victory. Amen. The second thing I'd have you note is the cross is good news because the charge of guilty was transferred to Christ. 
the charge of guilty was transferred to him. Look at Colossians chapter 2 in the Amplified. Having canceled and blotted out, wiped away the handwriting or the note, the bond, with its legal decrees and demands, which was enforced and stood against us, that was hostile to us. In the contemporary English version, it says this note with its regulations, its decrees, and its demands. He set aside clearing completely or cleared completely out of our way by nailing it to the cross. God wiped out the charges. Somebody say wiped out the charges. That were against us for disobeying the law of Moses. What's the law of Moses? That would be the Ten Commandments. And um, I remember times I didn't honor my father and mother. Anybody like that? And um, all of us have fallen short of the law of Moses. But he took them away, nailing them to the cross. That is good news, that he took it away, nailing it to the cross. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. We're going to receive communion a little bit later. I don't think we understand what a healing, powerful thing that communion is when we prepare our hearts, and I hope you online will, um, and we will here as well, prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord what he has for us. He bore our sins on the cross. And so we thank the Lord for that. The third thing I would have you note, the good news of the cross is that which Jesus did is sufficient and enough. I've noticed a lot of people get into works spiritually. It's really easy to say, well, if I do this, God will love me more than he does now. Could I tell you, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more than he does right now? Amen. There's nothing you can do that makes him love you more. And so sometimes we think, well, if I do this, I'll be more acceptable to God. That was a problem in the church of Galatia. Look at what Paul said to the Galatians. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised... See, some religious people were saying to the Gentile people, you got to be circumcised. Jesus, yes, he died on the cross, but if you're not circumcised, you're not really, you don't really have the, the assurance that you're going to heaven. But look at what Paul said. If you let yourself be circumcised, in other words, you give yourself to this, this law that man is laying on you, Christ will be no value to you at all. He said, again, I declare to you, every man who lets himself be circumcised, he is then obligated to the whole law. Have you read the law? Like 786 of them. And I don't want to be obligated to those. How about you? I mean, you might not have washed your hands right this morning. That was a part of the law. And so there's all these laws. And Paul says... If you try to add things like circumcision or anything else to your relationship with Christ, you're going to be having to go back into the Old Testament and obey all the law. How many of you know that's bad news? And we're talking about good news. I said I'm talking about good news. So those who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. And you have fallen away from grace. So Matthew, can I talk to you for a second? Do you mind if I, uh, this is a hypothetical Matthew, I don't want you to take this to the bank, but um, would you mind if I go to Prime Motors up in Sheridan and buy you a brand new truck? Be nice? Okay. And when I go, Matthew, I'm going to pay the taxes on it. I'm going to pay insurance. And um, all you've got to do is go up there and get the keys. Somebody say sweet. (laughs) And yet if Matthew, let's say that I did that. I'm not Matthew. Just just saying. But if I did do that and you decided this afternoon because you were feeling guilty 
that you needed to go to Prime Motors and pay for it yourself, that would be dumb. Somebody say, that'd be dumb. And yet that's what we do all the time. It's been paid in full. It was transferred to Christ. And we think, man, if I just read my Bible a little more, I'll be more saved. By the way, reading your Bible more won't get you more saved. It will help you know what the salvation Jesus has done for you means to you more. Praying more won't get you more saved. Testifying for Him won't get you more saved. He paid it all and it's enough. And all we need to do is step into the free gift of salvation. And when you stop making it a free gift, you put yourself under all of the law. And that's bad news. So why would you live with bad news when you can live all the time with good news? Here's a key point. If you think you must do more to be more, then you don't understand the good news of the cross. Let me say it again. If you think you must do more to be more, then you don't understand the good news of the cross. Number four, let's keep going, shall we? Um, I skipped some stuff, but that's okay. All right. The good news of the cross is not about helping the old you. The cross is designed to make in a new you. Amen. I want to tell you this morning, when you give your heart to Jesus, He declares you dead to your old life, but alive to your new life. Consequently, He no longer is working on the old you. The old you's messed up. The old you can be redeemed, but he exchanges the old you for a new you. That's good news. And so he is not working on the old you. Many Christians come into church and they think, well, I'll just put a little dab of Jesus on the old me. A little dab of Jesus on the old you isn't going to help you. In fact, if behavioral modification worked, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross. Amen. If you getting a little more discipline would have worked, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross. Now, I'm not against therapy and I'm not against counseling because I do counseling. But I want to tell you, counseling isn't going to save you. Jesus will. Amen. And so you can be in counseling forever and ever. And by the way, I don't recommend that you are forever and ever because it means you're looking to counseling, you're not looking to Jesus. And Jesus is the answer for everything that ails me. Amen. He's the answer for everything that ails you. Please understand, I know sometimes we need counseling. But the fact of it is, is he's not working on the old you. You shouldn't be either. You should be looking for the new you. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Somebody say the new has come. See, the father, here's a key point. The father doesn't say, hey, get rid of this and then I'll give you this. Because that would be religious legalism. He shows you his new life and he says it's all yours. So you put off the old and learn to walk in the new. Could I tell you, religion doesn't work. Amen. If it worked, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross. Amen. Tell somebody that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Tell somebody it's really bad news. I feel bad for the two of you, several of you that didn't have anybody to tell. You're just talking to yourself. That's okay. <laughs> Galatians 6 speaks of this. For my part, I'm going to boast about nothing but the cross of our master, Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, I've been crucified in relationship to the world, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns they dictate. Aren't you sick of others telling you what to do when Jesus says, I've got you. I've got you. He not only gets us, he saves us, he gives us the victory, and we can walk in glory. Now, let's go to number five. Because of the power of the cross, it allows a church to be a place of love 
acceptance and forgiveness. Acceptance doesn't mean that you have to condone my sin. Acceptance doesn't mean that I have to condone yours. But the cross means that this can be a place of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I heard a story once of someone who came in and, so, and somebody had the stupid audacity to tell her she didn't belong. And she said, if a sinner can't come to church, where can a sinner go? Sinners are welcome here. Amen. So are saints. Amen. And the church for too long has looked at people and judged them and kicked them to the curb. We think, Jesus saves, and I'm glad he saves me. And I believe he saves everybody, but I'm not comfortable with you going to my church. By the way, it's not your church. And it's not my church. It's his church. 1 Corinthians 6 is one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. The church of Corinth had a lot of challenges they had um, prostitutes that came in. They had um, um, abusers that came in. And it says, Or do you not know what, that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the religious people would be going, yes, that's right. But look at what Paul says. And that's what some of you were. Somebody say were. were. Doesn't say are. Says were. That's good news. Amen. That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. By the way, the word justified is an interesting word. If you put a few slashes in most words, you can figure out what they mean. The first four letters spell the word just. The next two, I-F. And the next is, would be a pronoun, I. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what the word justified means. Just as if I'd, somebody say just as if I'd. Just as if I'd. Never sinned. I know some of you are going. He made it just as if you'd never sinned. That's good news. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have consequences. What you sowed, you probably will have to reap. But your shame taken away in the name of the Lord. That's what some of you were. By the way, there's a couple of passages of Scripture that teach us what the kingdom was about. And teach us what the kingdom is and the values of the kingdom. And the church, if the church is to be the church that God called the church to be, would also need to function in the kingdom of God. The first one um, you remember, and, and it's not on the screen and we won't turn there, but it's John chapter 8. It's the story where the Pharisees, the rulers of the law, found a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They bring her to Jesus and say, Master, the law, the law of Moses says that such women should be stoned. What do you say? Now, the law of Moses also said such men should be stoned. And if she's caught in the act of adultery, my guess is somebody else might have been there. Are you with me? And so Jesus gets down on the ground and writes in the sand and then stands up and says, let he who is without sin 
cast the first stone. And then he goes back down and writes in the sand. I don't know what he's writing, but my guess is he's writing those dirty guys' sins. (laughs) And they left the oldest to the youngest. The oldest had a longer list. (laughs) And then Jesus stands back up, looks at her, and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, because the cross, I have the victory to break my chains, to break my habits, to break my addictions, and to walk free in the fullness of Jesus without shame. I'd have you grab a Bible and let's go to Luke chapter 15. I want you to see this. And you know this is the um, parable of the prodigal son. And I want to pull a section out of it, beginning with verse 18 of Luke chapter 15. Some of you can find it faster on your phones than you can in your Bibles. And some of you can find it faster in your Bibles than you can on your phones. This is an incredible passage of scripture and one like the cross that we take for granted and I'd like to declare to you that the cross takes away shame. When I really understand the good news of the cross, I no longer need to live in shame. Verse 18 says, I will set out and go back to my father and I will say to him, he's, he's coming to his senses, the prodigal son. Remember, he's gone and he's squandered all of his father's wealth because he asked for his inheritance ahead of time. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran. Somebody say he ran. He ran ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. I want to teach you something today that will make this parable make a lot more sense. In the Jewish law of the Talmud, there was a principle called kazaza. Somebody say kazaza. Kazaza. It's a fun word to say. But what kazaza is, is when a son had squandered his father's wealth, the city father's would meet the son at the gate before he could go home. Before he could get to his father, they would take a clay pot and they would crash it on the cement as a matter of broken relationship. The mother would be allowed to come and kiss her son goodbye. But the father was to remain in the house. So when this parable says the father ran to his son, he's running past the city gates to get to his son before the city fathers can shame him. That's Kazaza. It's not the Father's will that any should perish. And I'm telling you, Jesus hates shame. And Jesus hates it when you live and walk in shame. 
And the fact of it is, is your guilt was taken away at the cross when you gave your heart to Jesus. And what you're feeling and the shame you still feel isn't guilt. It's guilt feelings and they're different because your guilt is paid for. And your guilt is, is free. It was wrong for a Jewish man to hike up his robe, let his legs be shown as he ran to the city gates. And yet your father says, I will run to the city gates so that no one will ever kazaza you. Because I love you. And your shame is broken at the cross. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, I'm telling you the Father is just waiting to kazaza you. Let me give you one more. Number six, when you understand the cross, you will be thankful. And thankful people always, always attract breakthrough. Thankful people always attract breakthrough. Amen. When we receive communion in a little bit, thank you, Father. Thank you for Kazaza. Thank you for the breakthrough. Now let me share this word about shame. Isaiah 61. Instead of your shame, here's because of the cross, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will receive a double portion in your land. An everlasting joy will be yours. Amen. Is that good news or what? Let's do it again. Instead of your shame, let's read it together. You will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will receive your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land and an everlasting joy. We are so thankful that you joined us this morning. Your presence online is just such a blessing to us. We consider you family. Uh, we consider you an extension of all that God is doing here. We love to hear from you. We love to hear not only where you're from, but we want to know how to pray for you. We have online hosts that uh, always communicate with me things we need to pray about, as well as others that they, they, we have a prayer team that prays for you. Also, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Click the bell over there. That bell will notify you when content's coming out or messages are coming out to you from grace. And so thank you for joining us today. You have a great week. God bless you.